to give you now just a little bit of background information on the Oxford group, who they are, what they believed in, uh, probably the best way to do that is to give you a very brief biography of its founder, and that was a man by the name of Frank Bookman. And Bookman was a Lutheran minister in Pennsylvania, and uh, essential parts of his story go like this. Uh, he uh, was running a uh, home for young men in the Philadelphia area, and he had a visit from his board of directors uh, one evening, and they said to him, Frank, you're spending too much money uh, on these guys with the food bill. Could you please cut it down? And Frank, uh, like maybe some of us, had a big ego. And uh, he got angry. And he basically stormed out uh, of the room, quit his job, uh, was codependent, so he borrowed money from his parents, and he went on a tour of Europe. He was actually going to a conference there in a, in a town called Keswick, England. And what he learned from the resentment that he developed uh, between himself and those six men on the board is actually the beginnings of the, of the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. And uh, maybe a, a way to help you get an appreciation of that and of what he learned, uh, we just do a little work here on the board. Uh, what, what Bookman knew was he had anger between himself and in this case those other pe those other six men there was blockage he was uh, isolated from them angry with them resentful with them and as he went around england on his way to this uh, conference what he recognized was to the degree that he was cut off from these people to that very same degree he was cut off from God. In the liter A literature, they talk about the sunlight of the Spirit. Well, the sunlight of the Spirit could not get through to Frank Bookman. It was closed off. And he had an experience. The experience was uh, basically a surrender experience where he went into a little chapel got down on his knees and he surrendered. Basically what we would call in AA circles, step three. He then went and he wrote a letter of amends to the people who were on that board. Uh, and as he wrote the letter, what he noticed was as he's letting go of this resentment, a flow starts coming into him from here. And this, this was really the essential ingredient of the, the contribution that, that he made. And it may sound small now, but it's really phenomenal because he saw this as the model for changing the world. He got together with a, a young man the next day who uh, was at the conference, and he told him what happened to him. And he asked, do you have anything like that in your life? And the guy said, well, yes, I do. And as he shared it, that guy started getting right, right with God. And, you know, if this is throwing you at the beginning, then it's always, it's always good to kind of pause. I, I, had, a, I had a dear uh, teacher uh, in recovery who... Uh, struggled with this word. And the truth is nobody understands this word. If you think you understand God, um, you're kind of delusional. <laughs> we are incapable of understanding God. But we are, uh, we are quite capable of experiencing God. And this fellow had all sorts of terrible things done to him in the name of God. And what he did when he came into the program was instead of just writing God, he put another O in there and wrote good. And I think that man was probably more accurate and in touch with, with what, what is essential to recovery. It is that goodness is flowing through us, that that spirit of recovery is flowing through us. That, and that is the change. That is the death of the ego that we spoke about uh, a little bit earlier. So uh, what, you, what you see here is a, um, a connection um, to um, 
to the, to the world, to changing the world, to what your role is in the world, and it's all based on your spiritual condition. When Bill Wilson came along, uh, he got sober in the Oxford group, and what he did was uh, he attempted to capture the essence of the Oxford group program and write them into a series of steps. And the 12 became the number that he landed on. The Oxford group people never had steps, but they did have a program, they did have a process. And theirs kind of broke down into this. Uh, the first part of the process was connection. And that really became the first three steps, to connect the self to something beyond the self, all right? To connect it, one, two, three. The rest, or the ma ma major part of the program now becomes this, correction. What is it that is blocking this flow which Bookman believed ought to be natural? It ought to happen. His question is, why is it not happening? In his case, it was because of the hatred that he held in his heart for those six guys. And when he let go of that, he began to experience it. The last three, so this is, this is what? This is four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. This is where we make the correction, the change. Make a list of the people who are harmed, share that with another person, this becomes, uh, Wilson was asked, where did you put the central ingredient to, uh, to the, the Oxford Group program, which was honesty, purity, unselfishness, and love. Those, those are the four absolutes. He said, they were, he's asked, where did you put them? He said, I put them in six and seven. I put them in six and seven. So this is where we're really willing to change at a huge level to let go of everything that gets in the way, okay? And then eight and nine, uh, we make amends. The last three steps had to do with receiving direction, and that's 10, 11, and 12. 10 is taking daily inventory. 11 is the prayer and meditation practice that we're gonna talk about in just a moment. And then 12 is the action as I carry that out into the world. Pretty soon, alcoholics began coming to the Oxford group uh, in the 1930s because they needed to change. They weren't so interested in changing the world like Bookman was. They were interested in changing themselves, changing their, their own lives. So what happens is uh, Roland Hazard helps a man by the name of Ebby to get sober. Ebby then carries the message to Bill Wilson. Bill Wilson carries the message to Dr. Bob. And down the chain of events, it goes to where we have two to three million people now uh, working uh, some variety of the 12-step programs. The thing that I learned in, in doing my studies about the Oxford Group and early AA practices came down to this. In uh, 1938, uh, the people in AA were trying to, uh, to get some money from uh, J.D. Rockefeller uh, for this new program that they had. And Rockefeller sent a man by the name of Frank Amos to study it, examine it. Uh, it wasn't even called Alcoholics Anonymous like that, but he was looking at the people who got sober in Akron and New York and saying, what's happening here? What's going on here? And the report that he brought back, and this is reported in Dr. Bob and the Good Old Timers, uh, basic AA literature, that the members of that time did not consider meetings necessary to maintain sobriety. Now, that's going to sound like heresy today. Okay? Meetings, they believed, was not what was necessary. They were helpful. They were good. But they said in his report, morning devotion and quiet time, however, were musts. This is, this is not something that's optional. This is something that if you want to have that transformational effect in you, quiet time is the way it's going to happen. One of the first pieces of Oxford Group literature that I came across is this little pamphlet here, and it is entitled, How to Listen to God. Uh, it, and it kind of sums up some of the basic philosophy of, uh, of the meditation practices and the beliefs that uh, Oxford Group people had and early AA people inherited. 
some of the key factors, um, God has a plan for your life. God will tell you what you need to know in order to follow that plan. Maybe he won't tell you everything you need to know, but enough. And God will give you the power that you need to accomplish it. Anyone can be in touch with God, it says. Certain conditions must be met. What are they? Be still and listen. Write the thoughts that come. And then test the thoughts, because every thought is not going to be coming from God. Uh, so they tested them by honesty, purity, unselfishness, and love. If it met that test, uh, chances were pretty good. If it was a big question that you had, they'd say, talk it over with somebody else who's also practicing quiet time. So it wasn't that they just, uh, it's not like a seance that you, you get this information and off you go. Uh, but, but if you're trying to live by the absolutes, really trying to live and ask the question, what is God's will for me? What is he really asking of me? Uh, their belief was he will communicate that to you in some way. Now, what I've done is um, kind of take that information and modernize it a little bit. And uh, so what I want to do uh, now is sort of work you guys through this process. So uh, here, here, here's, here's what uh, it boils down to. Number one, preparation. Uh, you, you make a commitment that you're willing to practice quiet time for 10, 15 minutes for the next 30 days. Would you be willing to do that? Each morning to give it 10 or 15 minutes. Do it in the morning. Now, if it, I can negotiate on this a little bit. If, uh, if it's absolutely impossible, afternoon, evening, okay. But primarily it was morning time. When you're just getting up, that's the time to, to best do it. Choose a sacred spot, a usual spot where you can go to. In India, uh, everyone, no matter how poor they are, they've got a little altar in their home, a sacred spot where they can go to and they know that they're going to meet God when they go to that place. So I have a chair in my, in my computer room. It's a green leather chair. I, I go there. I don't read the newspaper there. I only go there to practice my quiet time. Then you get, uh, get yourself a notebook, uh, just any spiral notebook will do, and, uh, and then you're ready to go. Okay, so how to begin now? Well, number one is you sit in an upright posture. It doesn't have to be rigid, okay? But you don't have your, your, your feet sprawled on, uh, on, uh, on the desk in front of you. You've got to remember into whose presence you are coming. So can you cross your leg, I get asked? Yes, you can. You get comfortable but respectful, all right? Then they would read a short passage. This, I think, is somewhat optional, but if some sacred reading, and I always usually ask people, make it not another meditation book, because you're going to do your own, all right? But some sacred literature that works for you, okay, that you're comfortable with, that speaks to you. Take in a few deep breaths. And breathe yourself kind of coming into God's presence and, and breathe out the fear, the angst, or whatever is going on uh, in your life. Breathe in God's presence. Let go of your fear, your anxiety. And then you begin to write. You write a question, okay? You write a question. Uh, some sample questions might be something like this. Uh, God, I've tried getting clean and sober before. Please tell me what I need to do that's different this time. All right? Father, I feel so alone. I feel separated from you. Please help me to feel your presence. Some of them might be, I don't even know who you are. <laughs> Please talk to me. You come from what's real in you. Uh, Lord, I, I need guidance today because uh, something big is coming up in my life. And you write down just what that something big is. I'm afraid. Please help me. That's all. Short little question. But the key is it's an honest question. It's coming from a genuine need. All right? And then what do you do? You listen for God's voice. Uh, Carl Jung uh, used to call uh, this active imagination. If God were to speak to you, what might he say? Let it, let it happen. This is creative writing 101. If God were to speak to you, if the most loving presence in the universe were, were to come into your life, what is it that you are longing to hear from, from, from him? And then let it go. Let it happen. Just, 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 just write, all right? Pour it out, all right? 
You write the words that come. You don't try not to edit them. Um, if you get stuck, one of the things I've found that's really helpful is if, uh, if you will use a term of endearment, my beloved, my child, my brother, my son, God talking to me like that? Try it. Try it and see if it doesn't begin to trigger within you that intimacy that, uh, that uh, we're really, really looking for and searching for. And then stop when it feels like it's becoming forced. I generally do five, uh, maybe seven minutes uh, at a time. And then when it's done, put it down. And then feel God's presence. There's, you know, there's a whole other form of, of prayer and meditation called contemplative prayer. And that's the sort of prayer where you sit and you just sort of let your mind go free and you don't think anything. Uh, I find alcoholics and addicts are not terribly good at that. You know, half of us suffer from ADD. And this method is kind of nice because you don't have to go to total silence. You, let, you let, it, let it play out in your mind. But you know what? At the end of it, you're going to find yourself in silence. You're going to find yourself connected to God. And he's just given you the answer to something that your heart has been longing to hear maybe for, uh, for many, many years. So uh, do you have something that's troubling you, uh, something you need help with? Uh, if nothing comes to mind, I'd suggest maybe you start with one of the absolutes. Start with honesty. It's usually, it's usually the big one. Is there some area in my life where I'm still dishonest? Lord, help me. And then listen, okay? So I'm going to ask you to do that uh, and take about five, seven minutes. And then we're going to come back and, uh, and see how, how it's gone for you. So, so just at your places there, uh, go for it. Thanks. So I know it's uh, hard under circumstances like these to uh, to do the quiet time, and uh, I really appreciate it, Amy, that you've agreed to go first. So uh, before you get started, uh, just a quick question: uh, Was was it hard for you to kind of get get into it, or did a question right there, or how'd you go about that? Uh, it was it was definitely hard. The the first thing I wrote was actually this is hard. Um, <laughs> this is hard. <laughs> and uh, you know it's it's hard to to think and, and let go and allow yourself to hear something other than, than what's in your own head. Yeah, your and own thinking, right. Yeah. So, um, but after writing for a little bit, it, the answer, I think, did start to come. W would so, you be comfortable sharing that yeah, with us now? Absolutely. Please. Um, so the, the question that I asked was, uh, why can't I feel you? And, um, Good question. And uh, so, so I wrote for a while that that this was hard, and then then the answer that came was, um, well, a couple of things was that you're not trying to, mm -hmm. um, that you have expectations, and you're putting faith in other humans. Um, mm -hmm. And a big one that came up was that you're you're never Just, quiet. Ah, um, you're never quiet. So this yeah. is this is new for you, difficult. It's very new. Okay. So um Yeah. So, so just read what yeah. the voice says then. Um so it says you're never quiet, you need to be quiet and listen. Um you don't need to define or understand. Try something new. Um mm -hmm. don't have no judgment and no fear. Mm -hmm. Um and and no expectations. Um, it's nothing you have ever learned or been told. You need to build your own experience, and that experience becomes your truth. Wow. Beautiful. So. Beautiful. How'd that feel for you? Really good. And honest? Really Does good. it pass the honesty test? 
Definitely. It's not something manufactured. No. So you're kind of beginning to work out your relationship with your higher power. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So trust, listen, uh, get into the silence. Right. Yeah. And I, I think the biggest part of that was don't, the no judgment and the no expectations. Yes. Because uh, I, I bring that to this work. It's like, well, it should sound like this, or people have this relationship, but this is yours. Right. This is uniquely yours. Mm -hmm. And uh, and ordinarily, you don't have to share it with everybody. Right. <laughs> Something like this. So, great. Good, good job. So, Thank, you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. So, Sierra, I think uh, you're up next if you're ready. Yep. Okay. All right. My question. God, I have difficulty placing myself in others' shoes and seeing things from another perspective other than my own. Mm -hmm. um, please help me to become more connected to the minds of others so that I can be more helpful, loving, and compassionate. And for my response, I started with your suggested um, term of endearment. Mm -hmm. um, my child, start by becoming more honest with your own feelings and struggles when you speak to your sponsor and your confidence. Go slow, go slow. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, too often, you yourself don't allow your true feelings to be known. Your honesty will elicit reciprocal honesty and those you are sharing with, and you will begin to understand the minds of others enough to avoid the instances of acting in selfishness that you have that have so hindered you in the past. When your confidence are honest, when your confidants are honest with you, truly listen. Listen to my voice and listen to the voices of others. Mm -hmm. How did that feel? It felt good. It was a little difficult at first, um, mm -hmm. but I think it really helped um, to use the term of endearment. And then once it got flowing, right. it felt really good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. You're off and running. Some people get kind of choppy, quick uh, answers. Some people get, get uh, answers that flow, and uh, you're, you're definitely into the flow style. <laughs> 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 Wonderful. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. And Dwayne, I think uh, you're up next. So you're a, a newcomer to this whole process, huh? Absolutely. How was it for you? Was it... I was pretty intense trying to look into a side of myself I don't normally look into. Okay. Uh, a little uncomfortable? A little bit at first. But you got into it, you were able to do it? Absolutely. Okay. Would you be willing to read what you, what you came up with? Uh, the question that I asked myself was, how does selfishness still play a part in my life today? Okay. I don't know what I wrote was, that when I first got sober, uh, I thought that most of this would change, and it, at first it did. And but I found that much like taking the first drink, uh, the unselfishness got easier each subsequent time that it, that it came up. And I find that it's a it's a part of myself that I'd really like to explore. Um, I like to see myself in more of a, a selfless role. Uh, I like to see myself going around doing things for the greater benefit of the group, not just for myself. Um, mm -hmm. I, th I think it would make make the world a better place. Okay. Did you hear anything in a, in a different voice? Uh, it sounds like you're thinking. It's a lot of thinking. A lot of thinking. Um, I don't know if I actually heard anything. Didn't hear any breakthroughs of... Uh, uh, well, let me, let me just... I'm going to do a little quiet time with you right now. Okay. Uh, if God were to say to you something that you really long to hear from him, long to hear somebody to say, what do you think that might be? And put it in his voice. Open up your heart to the world around you. Okay. What else? Try to listen more. Try to listen more. Yeah. All right. If you take the quiet time, that's a, that's a real common thing that when people first start, uh, they start doing journaling. Yeah. And they start, they start writing the thoughts that are uh, running through their heads. But if you can make that switch inside... So I'm hearing a voice. Uh, it really kind of opens up the feelings and takes it to a different level. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for Good the job. opportunity. Good job. All right. Uh, Lauren, um, I know you've been practicing quiet time now for about six months. And uh, if you could, I'd like you to read the, the messages that you got this time, and then we can go to maybe a writing that you did a little while ago. Okay, I would love to. Um, my one from today, I put, Dear God, why do I still avoid relationships with my fellows? Please mm. help me. Dear my precious child, 
You are scared and hurting. As of right now, your grieving process of your grandpa's death has just begun. Own your fears, insecurities, and resistance to growing closer to them, especially with your family. Keep seeking me, and I will offer you strength, strength, love, and courage with your family and friends. Be yourself, love fearlessly, and keep quieting your doubting voice inside your head. Be proud of who you are. Love God. Beautiful. And you got a little heart there, too. Yeah, that's how I end all of them. <laughs> I end he all of them. He signs it with a heart. Beautiful. Beautiful. You, your grandfather just passed away? Um, he did when I was 11 oh, and okay. it just recently came up for me. Wow. So, wow. yeah. Feelings are coming back. Yeah. Right? yeah mm -hmm. Feeling the songs we didn't feel before. Yeah. Beautiful. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, I know you're out in the Grand Canyon on a trip, uh, just recently. Uh, could you share the writing you had from, from that experience? Yes, I will. Okay, um, part of my reading that I read before was out of a vision for you. Mm -hmm. um, I, re I wrote down on page 153, love thy neighbor as thyself. Dear God, why am I so insecure with my physical limitations and not being good enough? Please help me. And if I could just interrupt for a minute, what was going on when you asked that question? Um, well, we were in the Grand Canyon and... We like we had a few hikes that we had to do, and uh -huh. I was pretty insecure and scared that I couldn't do it. Okay. And also, my intention for the trip was to quiet the doubting voice inside my head. Oh wow! So um, bringing that stuff to my quiet time really helped me a lot throughout the day, um, especially when that stuff did come up with like hikes or rowing or whatever. Right. So, yeah. So you just kind of brought your fear to the table. Yes. Okay, beautiful. Let's. What do you say? Um, I put, or he put, Dear Lauren, you limit yourself. You feel not good enough, but you are not your feelings. Mm. Your actions are what shines through and shows who you are and is truly who you are. Be that today. Let yourself be free from your feelings and defects that keep you stuck. Pain is only temporary. Work hard, push hard, and bring honesty and effort into everything you do today. Believe in yourself. Love God. Beautiful, beautiful. And did it, did it give you some courage? Yeah. It did, huh? Yes, it did. All right. It was really effective for me and has really been effective in my program, too. You've been doing meditation. it about six months? Yes. Pretty steady at it? Pretty steady. Pretty Not steady. Perfect Not perfect. <laughs> okay. Beautiful. Well, thank you so much. That's great. Thank you. That's great. And Kirk, I know uh, you've been doing quiet time now for, uh, I think, about six months. Correct. And uh, I'm going to ask you if you do two readings. First one, maybe the, the one that did here, and then uh, a second one that uh, you feel comfortable sharing with the group. Sure. The um, one I did today was the uh, question or, or thought that I had was um, the affection, expressing love, and feeling present. I see it slipping and it feels, and I feel like pressure. And this is the answer that I got okay. um, today. My man, what a day. Let us take a moment and smile. Smile at the celebration and the connection you have with others. Just allow yourself one moment to smile, enjoy it. Be a little proud. Secondly, breathe deeply. Do it again. The pressure is in the fear and in the ego, the desire to control. I see it in you, and I will take and I will take it. I do love when you give me these things. The man you are when you are calm, present, centered, passionate, and filled with love is a very powerful advocate for my work. Listen, listen to this. I see this man. The affection is so natural for us. It is your natural state of being. Stay with me. I am here. Beautiful, beautiful. Uh, it's the, the, the sensation I had was it's drifting from the, the true self into the false self. And when I get into that false self uh, uh, stage, I get uncomfortable. And uh, 
it seems like the voice is calling you back and drawing, drawing you back into who you truly are. Does that feel right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's, I mean, there's a lot more I could say about that, but yeah, yeah I mean, it feels, um, Go ahead. it feels, I'm, I feel much more like one person when I am affectionate and right. loving and I express that affection towards others. Right. And it flows through you. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Kirk, Kirk runs a large program that deals with young, young kids in recovery in Houston and, uh, uh, just does a terrific job over there. And a lot of those kids are starting to do this quiet time work as well. So uh, They are. Fantastic. Fantastic. Yeah. All right. Um, this, was, this was probably about six weeks ago. Mm -hmm. God, I, I do not feel connected to you. I feel a distance growing and feel alone. And this was my answer. My son, my son, please be calm. Please breathe deeply, breathe deeply, deeply, often and early. Mm. Do you feel that weight? I know you do. The weight is fear. The weight is love. The weight I can help you with. I can carry it. Mm. I will carry it. I will carry it all, all of it, all the time. Mm. I do not need you to be all things to all people. I do not need you to be perfect. The person I am inside is the person I present to the world. Remember when you said this? This is so beautiful. Who is that person? I know this man. He is love, loved, scared, committed, faithful, loyal, powerful, emotional, loud, and my man. <laughs> wow. And you went into that feeling disconnected. Yes. That was your, that was your question. Yeah. How'd you come out of it feeling? I came out of it ready to get to work. That day, <laughs> <man>. uh, <laughs> you know, like right. bring on the kids. Yeah. Huh? I came in, I'm I came ready. out of it like, uh, you know, like bring it, you know, <laughs> what's next. I can make it through today. Yeah. Fantastic. Hey, thank you so much. That's beautiful. It's an honor to be here. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I've asked a couple of friends uh, to come in and uh, who've been doing this for a while and, and see, what, see if that maybe sounds a little bit different. Uh, so, uh, Dawn, uh, if you would, maybe you'd uh, share a little bit of your, your writing with us today. Absolutely. Um, this is a process that I've been doing with Bill, with you, for about nine years now. Mm. So, um, on this day, uh, I just, it was really a good day. There wasn't anything going on that I was angst about. So when I began the writing, I just kind of opened up with a question. And self says, Father, what blocks me today? What are my blockages that I do not even know about? And Father says, false self. It is always the false self that blocks you, my child. It can take many different faces. It can be pridefulness and stubbornness or it can be the exaggerated victim. To be a loving channel of connection is always your goal. When debris begins to collect in your channel, your flow of unconditional love gets blocked. Mm. Father says, since you've been so sober, have any, of your, have any of your deepest fears come true? Father says, no, relax into my shoulder, snuggle with me, do not fight the journey. The false self, the pride, the ego, it's its job to make you uncomfortable. It's my job to comfort you. Mm. On your journey, walk with me. You will grow and learn. The false self wants you to be stuck. It wants you to fight and to exhaust yourself. Connect with me. Be with me. Know that I am and that you are. You are my child. You are my flesh. You are my mm. breath. Go forth not in fear. Know that I am. Wow. That's powerful. That is really powerful. Uh, could you feel that energy mm. coming in, the flow coming in? Absolutely. And, and there, was, uh, there was some blockage there that this mm -hmm. sort of just opened up. It wasn't yeah. much going on, you said. Yeah, there wasn't much going on. And when I presented the question right. and then... As the answer came back, 
uh, there was a lot of feeling. You know, there was a lot of yeah. anxiety and fear that I wasn't even aware that was residing deep inside of me. And then for it to turn around and for it to be that strength and to know that all's well. Sometimes when I'll sit down and do a quiet time session, it's like, I'm not in a good place. There's nothing much going to happen here. Mm -hmm. And if I can get really honest with my question, sometimes that really helps open things up. Yeah. You know, uh, just... You just say where you are, and then, boom, sometimes you really get surprised. Beautiful. It makes me aware of things that yeah. I don't even realize are going on with me. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Dawn, thank you. That was, that was beautiful, and I really appreciate your sharing that with us today. Uh, Scott, uh, one of the reasons I asked you to come in uh, is kind of a special thing, that uh, in the course of your doing quiet time, an incident came up from, uh, from your childhood, uh, and then you wrote several sessions uh, about that. So could you share for us just a little bit about what was going on there and then read some of the writings that, uh, that God spoke to you with in terms of how to handle it? Sure. The incident that happened, I was in the fourth grade, and uh, my sister and I and uh, my best friend and his older sister uh, were playing with gasoline in the backyard, and uh, he kicked the can over and it splashed all over his sister, and she... Uh, she pretty much burned to death. She lived another three months, but uh, she died after three months. And I, all my life, I've partially blamed myself for that or, or felt guilt about it. Or, mm -hmm. uh, it just haunted me from time to time. Right. And uh, as I was going through just a, a regular quiet time, uh, didn't have that on the radar screen at all. It just popped up. and There it was. There it was. Yeah. So... Well, could you share a little bit uh, sure. with us what that was like? My question that day was, how can I stay on, on your path and, uh, and weed the garden? And just, it was like a laundry list, your closet, your office, your file drawer, your investments, discernment. Uh, and then this came, the child is running from the fire. Talk mm. with him the way his parents never did. Reassure him it wasn't his fault. Set him on the right path. He is very afraid. Only I can heal, but you must bring him to me. A new dawn is coming. You will be there unafraid. Talk with Wanda. She knows me. She trusts me. She has me in her heart. She is at peace. She rescued, from a, rescued you from a tree long ago. Pay attention to her story. Trust her. Wanda is the morning star, the last one before the dawn. And Wanda was the older sister of the family of the girl that burned the right. death. Yeah. And I wept after that session. I just broke down and cried. Mm -hmm. And a few days, about a month later, I guess, I said, Father, what would I say to Wanda? Mm. And the answer was, tell her about quiet time. Tell her that God indicated a need to see her. Tell her how the fire has affected your life. I felt like I ran for the hose and just kept running. There was nothing I could do. Run from life, it was too painful. Run from responsibility, I was bad at it. Run from pain, run from sorrow. It's not there, deny it. God through Jesus fixes our brokenness. I saw you had peace and faith. Your brother was my best friend growing up. We both ran from the specter of the fire in similar ways. We both found the comfort and prison of chemical addiction. I was saved. He was not. Why? Mm. I am finally safe in my father's arms. I think he is too. He never got over it. I was saved by the Holy Spirit in AA, and I want to pass that on. And then uh, I guess about two weeks later, uh, I kept having fear of seeing Wanda, so I... Mm -hmm. My question was, why do I have this fear of seeing Wanda, and what do I do about it? Because it, the guidance kept saying to you, you need to go see her. Yeah. And you kept saying, I don't think I want to do this. She's going to think I'm a nut or something. Right. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. Where Understood. did you come from all these years? Right. Uh, you are afraid of going through the pain again. You are afraid of giving the pain to Wanda again. Pain is the pathway to me. Mm. You have to learn to trust me. I will make all things right. Believe in me. Give me the fear. 
Talk to Bill some more. Wanda is my child. She truly knows me. There is two children and their father on the same path, you and her. October is the time. Keep praying about this. Much fear to give to me. Yeah. And so the guidance seemed to direct you, even in terms of the time, when, when it was appropriate to go? Yes, and, and October is the time. It was the time. <laughs> okay, sweet. Uh, and then, uh, but I was still full of fear, and uh, about another two weeks went by. Heavenly Father, I still have fear of going to Wanda and what to say. And the guidance said, I will tell you what to say or not. I will provide intuition. I am the great healer. I will take your fear from you. Just walk through the fire. I will keep you unharmed. Mm -hmm. Use words from the quiet time on this subject. Your fear of what people will think is bigger than reality. Wanda is my child. She knows me and walks with me. She trusts me. Anything you say won't hurt her. Come back to me again on what to say. I will take your fear and lead you on your way. Till then, my blessings will flow. And then on the day, the day I went to see Wanda, I was still in fear, but uh, this was the morning, the morning of the same day. And I uh, said, Jesus, please give me the right words and actions today. Guide and direct me. The guy that said, you are walking into the garden of true belief. Do not be afraid. Peace and light are with you. I am with you. I am real. I am true wisdom and salvation and healing. Today you will be given one of the keys to the kingdom. The key unlocks a door. More will be revealed. Through me is all healing and power. More will be revealed. More will be revealed. It's beautiful. And it went well. Yeah. The both of you well. cried. Yeah. Yeah. And she was glad you came. Yeah. yeah. She was glad to see me. And, and just since then, I've just had such a feeling of closure on the whole incident. Right. And, right. Yeah. And forgiveness and just healing. Wow. And, uh, yeah. That's beautiful. Was, That's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. You're welcome. So now that you've uh, had an opportunity to learn about quiet time and, and the practice and how they did it, the question really becomes, going forward, uh, how can you put this to use in your life? Well, there's a number of ways. Uh, probably the simplest is just get started on it yourself. Do it, do it yourself each morning. Uh, try it for 30 days, and if uh, there's a money-back guarantee that comes with this, if you do this consistently each day, devote 10, 15 minutes to this practice, I believe you'll stay with it for the rest of your life. Uh, so do it alone and, and see where it leads you. Second uh, way to do it is to do it with a friend or a sponsor. If you're in a recovery program, you have a sponsor, uh, get together with that person and, and say, can I share some of the writings that have come up for me? And, uh, and then start reading them to that person. It's a wonderful, wonderful way to, to involve him or her in a much, much deeper part of your life. Third way might be to start a quiet time group. And these are starting to happen around the country uh, where people are getting together and, and they can really be done in one of two ways. One can do it within a particular fellowship, Alcoholics Anonymous, Cocaine Anonymous, uh, Narcotics Anonymous, Al-Anon, whatever it might be. Uh, and your focus would be on the last three steps of the program. Ten, taking that daily inventory, sitting down and, and looking at yourself, uh, awareness. 11, listening to God, and then 12, what actions, activities is God leading you toward? I, I hope you will uh, take this information and put it to whatever work it is that you are guided to do with it. Uh, I want to give you a little final quote, uh, actually two. Uh, first one is from Frank Bookman, who we've talked about, and he said this in the 1930s in a speech, and it just kind of drives home the message of what I hope this video has been about. He said, the Holy Spirit is the most intelligent source of information in the world today. He has the answer to every problem. Everywhere where men will let him, he is teaching them how to live. Divine guidance must become the normal experience of ordinary men and women. Any man can pick up divine messages if he will put his receiving set in order. 
Today we might say downloaded from God. But he goes on, he finishes, definite, accurate, adequate information can come from the mind of God into the, the minds of men. And then let me close with um, just a quick reference to the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous and the way they close after they have described the program. But now that you've learned something about quiet time, maybe the words that you're hearing in this final chapter uh, might take on some new meaning for you. God will constantly disclose more to you and to us. Ask him in your morning meditation what you can do each day for the man who is still sick. The answers will come if your own house is in order. See to it that your relationship with him is right and great events will come to pass for you and countless others. We shall be with you in the fellowship of the Spirit and you will surely meet some of us as you trudge the road of happy destiny. May God bless you and keep you until then and thank you so much for watching this video with us.